All right, good morning, everyone. Today, we're going to study pulse width modulation. This builds upon the last lecture where we saw AC to DC, uh, DC to AC converters, and we limited our analysis there to something fundamental and very simple. The idea of lecture six was to either provide a positive or a negative voltage in the output, and that positive or negative voltage level was fixed, was coming from a fixed power source. As we briefly discussed towards the end of the lecture, if we now want to vary that voltage from a, anything that goes from the voltage source to the negative value of the voltage source and go in between, then you can simply extend the idea, expand the idea of uh, the inverter and use a variable duty cycle to now control also the magnitude of that voltage in addition to the polarity of the voltage. And that's the idea of pulse width modulation. Pulse width modulation is simply a way to control the duty cycle dynamically so that the level of the output voltage can be controlled precisely. And it can now go from a positive to a negative value uh, of the voltage input. So this is what you're going to see today. And as you can imagine, this has many applications in the mechatronic systems. And most of you will end up using this for your design project. So today we're going to understand the principles of pulse width modulation, control the voltage of a sine phase inverter using pulse uh, width modulation and model a pulse width modulation controlled circuit. As I said, there are many applications of PWM. Here is one, there's not really a PWM application itself, but it's one way where, it's where we use it typically in mechatronics, one of the uh, one example is a servo motor. The servo motor is has an internal PID controller or PD controller for most of them, and the idea is that you give it a signal, you give it a voltage, and it will move by a certain position, and that position is proportional to the input voltage you give to it. If we are to use data logic using an analog input, then our microcontroller would have to provide the analog input. Uh, analog output to the servo. And then based on the difference, based on the voltage magnitude, the servo would go to specific position and stop. The problem with that is that we have an analog voltage, so there is not very accurate, they're subjected to noise. The idea is to replace that with a digital pin. And using the digital pin, we can only go on and, on and off. So the idea now is to modulate that same voltage, but instead of using an analog signal, we use a digital signal on and off, and we modulate the duty cycle of that signal. In this way, now the servo motor will take, will look at the pulse width, will look at the duty cycle, and based on the duty cycle, we'll now move to a given position, typically from zero to 180 degrees, where zero is matched to zero duty cycle, and 180 degrees would be matched to 100% uh, duty cycle, and then you can go anywhere in between. The servo itself has an internal controller, so we will go to that position regardless of the external disturbances. Here is another example. Let's assume that we have this LED uh, system, LED light, and we have a very simple transistor to control it. If a transistor is on, it conducts, a transistor is off, no current flows through it, and then it does not conduct. If we now apply a pulse width, uh, uh, if we apply a duty cycle, a variable duty cycle to activate that transistor, we can now control the brightness of this LED. And this brightness can now vary from anything from zero to VCC. And again, the average and the RMS voltages across the LED can all be controlled through the duty cycle that we apply to that transistor. Notice once again, that the power here is coming from the power input, it's coming from this VCC external power supply. This signal can be simply a on-off signal, a digital pin from a microcontroller, for example. And all power is being taken from an external source. We saw this beauty in the last lecture. This is an inverter. We can use this to control a DC motor or many other uh, systems. And we studied this one in detail. Based on what we saw in lecture six, here we would be able to either apply VCC to the output or negative VCC to the output based on 
a specific combination of forward and reverse. We also saw that there's a, this PWM signal here. And this PWM signal will now take that a duty cycle, that a varying duty cycle or the PWM signal. Instead of simply being on and off, we can now control the voltage across the motor going from VCC, positive VCC to negative VCC, right, depending on which leg of the transistor, the, the bridge we actuate. For example, as we saw there, if we control this too, and you define a say positive voltage like that, this would be plus VCC. And if you do the other combination it would be negative VCC. Right? That assuming that a PWM is either zero or one, but if it now it's varying using a duty cycle, then the voltage there would be K times VS times the sign that we choose depending on the combination, depending on the lag we are activating. Here is another example. Let's assume that we have this half bridge inverter and we want to control, excuse me, we want to control the output voltage, excuse me, across the load. And this output voltage has to be a sinusoidal waveform. How can you perform that? Notice that the input is still a DC voltage, right? It's VS is DC. How can we create a sinusoidal waveform in the output? Or for, for that matter, any any shape, any uh, periodic signal that is positive and negative in the output. Right? And this would be, for example, the, the case when you have solar panels that are create a DC voltage and you need to inject that power into a AC grid at a specific frequency, say, say 50 Hertz. And how can we do that? How, we can, how can we create a sinusoidal waveform from a DC input that is exactly 50 Hertz and then inject that into a power grid. Let's uh, take this slowly one step at a time. So let's start with the DC to DC converter duty cycle, just as uh, to refresh your memory, this is from lecture five. We have this simple arrangement here. This is a step down converter. We have a load and a gate. The, the transistor operates as an ideal gate. If the transistor conducts, then the load voltage is the source voltage. And if the transistor does not conduct, then the load voltage is zero. We saw in lecture five that by modulating the duty cycle of that gating signal uh, K1, uh, Q1, we can now control the average and the RMS voltage across the load. If we take this signal, for example, and apply that to uh, Q1, we have a periodic signal whose period is T from here. And we are going to let the transistor conduct for a amount of time T1. Our duty cycle is then defined as T1 over capital T. T1 is the amount of time the transistor conducts. In other words, the amount of time the load is subjected to the input voltage and capital T is the total period of that signal, one over the frequency. And if you now change the duty cycle, you see that a T1 increases. Uh, the duty cycle increases, T1 increases. And by doing that, we are now increasing the average and the RMS voltages across the load. For the average voltage, we saw that that is simply Vs, the, power, the source voltage times the duty cycle K itself. For the RMS voltage, we saw the derivation in lecture five, and the conclusion is that that would be Vs times the square root of the duty cycle K, all right? A simple reminder here, this is still a DC to DC converter. This is a step down converter because now the output voltage goes from zero to Vs. It goes to zero when K equals to zero and it goes to Vs when K equals to one. Now let's complicate our example slightly and let's assume that now we have a reference voltage that we want to apply to the load. And that reference voltage is this blue line that we see here. It has a period of two pi, so uh, on omega t, so we, uh, two pi radians per second. So we take the frequency out of the equation and 
it has a specific frequency, it has a specific magnitude. And now we want this magnitude to appear in the output. You see that for the first half cycle from zero to pi, we have a given value. And from pi to two pi, that value decreases. Now, if you want to replicate the signal in the output, we need to dynamically adjust the duty cycle to reflect that. How we do it? Same way we generated a duty cycle before. We now have the reference signal, that's a periodic signal, and we have a carrier signal. The carrier signal here is a triangular waveform uh, with, which has double the frequency of the reference signal in this example. And you're now going to compare them. When the reference signal is greater than the carrier signal, we are turn, turning the transistor on. And when the reference signal is the smaller than the carrier, the transistor is off. So this is now the duty cycle that we are going to apply to Q1 in the input there. This results in a frequency, uh, in a vo load voltage that is either Vs or zero, as we see in the third graph. And if you had some sort of inductive load, the current would rise like that and decrease like that. Professor? But we see, yes. Um, you said like over here, if the carrier signal is larger than the reference signal, that's when you, uh, that's when you turn on? It, when the reference signal, if I said that, I was, I, I, I made a mistake. I meant the reference signal is greater than carrier signal. Okay. Right. Okay. Is what we see here. And when the reference signal is, is smaller than the carrier, so the carrier is greater than the reference, then it's zero. That makes sense. Thank you. All right. Okay. So nothing really new here, but we see now that the duty cycle dynamically adjusts based on the reference signal magnitude. If we have a reference signal whose magnitude here is a r and a uh, sorry a r is the reference signal so the blue one and the carrier signal has a magnitude a c we're going to define what we call the modulation index as the reference magnitude divided by the carrier magnitude if this is one then they are both the same the output voltage is Vs. If this is zero, then the reference signal is zero, the duty cycle is zero, the load voltage is also zero. Okay, this is called the modulation index. We apply that example to a DC to DC converter, but what we want to do is a DC to AC converter. We want to create a AC output. So how do we do that? Well, it's very simple. Take now the AC bridge that we defined before. This is a full bridge inverter. And you're going to create now two signals, one for each leg. And by leg, I mean the orange set of transistors and the green one. You see that the transistors in the same leg will not conduct at the same time because it would create a short circuit. So the this transistor is connected to that transistor, creating a path for the positive for a positive current through the load. And this transistor is connected to that transistor to create a negative a path for the negative current through the load. Now our job is to define this Q1 and Q2. Same idea. We are going to use a reference signal and a carrier signal. We're going to start with a so-called single pulse width modulation only one pulse per half cycle exists. So our half cycle is, uh, is with respect to the reference signal, which here again is the blue, blue uh, line and has a period of two pi. We're going to create now a carrier signal that has uh, twice that, um, that has, sorry, that has the, the same period and we see that we have one cycle, or one cycle of the, it really depends on how I define this. If we define this as a, a positive, if you define a, the, the period as T right there, then you have only one pulse per half cycle of the carrier signal, the reference signal. And you're going to do the same comparison as we did before. 
if the reference is greater than the carrier, then we can say that Q1 is on. And this is only valid, Q1 is only valid for positive voltages because the way it is wired in the bridge is for to deliver positive voltages only. So if the reference signal is positive, we are dealing with Q1 and Q2 must be uh, taken care of later. So for the first half cycle, the, the voltage reference voltage is positive. So we are now dealing with Q1 and the same comparison occurs here. When the voltage now of the reference voltage switches to a negative voltage, then you're looking at Q2 and you're com again comparing the magnitude of these two signals to now calculate a new gating signal. And this new gating signal Q2 goes to the other part of the bridge, the, uh, the one in, in green. And now you see here, if you compare Q1 and Q2, only one of these branches is conducting at a time. It's either positive or either negative. Depending again on the magnitude of the reference signal, the reference signal, the duty cycle will adjust and the magnitude of the output will now adjust as well. And when we com uh, combine these two Q1 and Q2, we have the voltage across the load that now follows a positive and a negative pattern in the same way that you have the reference signal up there. We're going to call this the width of this reference signal delta that we see here. And this is occurring within half cycle. So it is centered in at pi over two. One cycle is two pi, half cycle is pi. And that, uh, that pulse occurs, it is centered at pi over two. So if the width of that uh, that a pulse is delta, we are going from pi over two minus delta over two, right? Pi over two minus this distance, which is delta over two, to pi over two plus delta over two. Now this is useful to find the RMS voltage as we'll, we'll see before. Now we can define the bounds of that a pulse width given the, uh, the width delta. We are again controlling again controlling the var the output voltage through what you call again the modulation index, the magnitude of the reference signal divided by the magnitude of the carrier signal. This is given a variable k, and k is the duty cycle. It turns out that this corresponds exactly to the duty cycle. If you do the trigonometric calculation there, it will correspond to the duty cycle. When the modulation index is zero, what is the voltage across the load? Zero. And when the modulation index is one or greater than one, then the output voltage is plus minus Vs, depending on which leg we operate. For single pulse modulation, pulse modulation, then you have the duty cycle corresponding to M and our job is relatively easy now. now the advantage of this approach is that this can uh, adjust automatically as the reference signal changes magnitude. Any any questions so far? No? Yes, quick question, sorry. Go ahead. Um, uh, could you, could we, I might've missed it, but could you quickly tell us or tell me what or where the reference signal is coming from and where the, the other signal is the carrier the, the signal. Yeah. So from. the reference signal is what we want to control. So this could be the output of a PID controller, for example. Okay. Or it could be something that we set the system. We want the system to follow that reference. The carrier signal is something internal to the microcontroller that it generates the PWM signal. It's something that we have to create. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank right. you. It's, a, it's our reference signal that we build. In, if you use an Arduino, all this will happen automatically. We just tell the duty cycle, and then you will find the, the a way to, uh, to operate in that way. Uh, but if you want to determine the duty cycle itself, then electronically we need to create that alternating signal somehow. The 
the uh, triangular waveform. All right, so now let's go start the boring part a little bit. What is the RMS output voltage across the load? For the RMS voltage, we can take half of a cycle, multiply that by two to get the entire cycle and divide that by the period, which is one over two pi. We are going to take this integral, which is this area here. So from pi plus delta over two, two uh, from pi over two minus delta over two to pi over two plus delta over two. So this is the bounds that we defined before, which characterize the width of this pulse. We are taking the RMS voltage, so the voltage is squared, and you're integrating that over d omega t to get rid of the frequency, get rid of the frequency information. And it turns out that the RMS voltage, after we solve that equation, is Vs, the square root of delta over pi. And delta, once again, is the width of the pulse. Okay, that's the RMS voltage across the loop. Now, what is how do you define that at delta? If you look at this equation here, it's not very practical. If you want to calculate exactly what the RMS voltage is, we first need to find delta, the pulse width. But that is easy to find. The modulation index is defined as the time something stays on divided by the total period. We can define that in with regards to the pulse width as well. The total period for half a uh, pulse is, or half a cycle is pi, and the time it stays on is delta. Is is the same idea. This is the same another way to 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 calculate the modulation index that we calculated before as the ratio of the magnitude of the carrier and the reference signal. That gives the duty cycle. What is the duty cycle? The duty cycle is time on divided by total time. Time on for a half a cycle is delta, is the pulse width, and total, total cycle for half a cycle is pi. So delta over pi is also the modulation index. Thus we can equate these equations here and replace delta over pi in the equation for the RMS voltage we saw before. And surprise, surprise, the RMS voltage equals to Vs divided times the square root of the modulation index. And before this was K, right? For the DC to DC converter. It's the same idea here. All right, so we come to the very same equation we started in lecture five. Any, any questions at this point? Uh, question. Yep. What would even be, besides like finding these values quicker, what would even be the importance of like doing RMS when you're working sort of with like a, a digital signal kind of environment? For now. For now, it looks like a digital signal in the output, but it's actually an analog signal. We are limiting that to on off positive negative, but we will get there. We will now do a full sinusoidal waveform. Okay, thank you. It, also, you know, we need to talk about RMS voltage because what is the app? If we have a 50, this case here has clearly a 50% duty cycle. Uh, for, oh, let's say 50% duty cycle. What is the average voltage across the load is zero, right? So it doesn't make sense to talk about average in AC. We need to introduce the concept of RMS. But you're we we are talking about the output voltage, right? Which again, now is on purpose limited to plus minus Vs or something in between with this rudimentary on off pattern. But we can refine that and we'll do that in the next slides. And here it is. So instead of using a single pulse, we can use the multiple pulse per half cycle. So now we have a carrier signal and a reference signal and their frequencies don't match anymore. The carrier signal frequency is typically much greater than that of the reference signal. So the reference signal can now change in frequency as well. So long as the carrier has a much greater frequency than the reference signal. Uh, professor? Yep. Uh, wait, wait. How does the microcontroller know what the reference signal is? It's up to us. Oh, the, the reference signal, we need to define that. 
the carrier signal is internal to the microcontroller. We, we set that up. Let's say a 50 kilohertz, very high, uh, 100 kilohertz, 50 kilohertz signal. It's internal. Now, the reference signal is what we want to display in the output. So it could be anything. And the example I gave before is the reference signal could be the output of a PID controller. And then the output of the PID controller is basically a desired voltage that it needs to be established in the output, needs to be applied to the plant. And that is our reference. That is we what, what we want to see happening in the plant. So that becomes our reference signal. But it's, uh, it's up to us as designers to define where this reference signal is coming from. The reference signal essentially is the desired voltage in the output. Let's put it that way. Right, that it completely depends on the application we are dealing with. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. Yep. All right. So now we have a carrier signal has a frequency FC and we have a peak value AC and you have a reference signal whose frequency is FR and the peak value is AR. Typically, again, the carrier frequency is much greater than the reference frequency. Question, what determines which of these signal determines the frequency in the output, determines the fundamental frequency in the output, the carrier or the reference? Is it the reference? It's the reference because that's again, what exactly what we want to display. The, the carrier signal is just a little tool that we are using to determine the duty cycle, but what it determines when you switch from positive to negative and you create a uh, periodic signal in the output is what we want to display in the output, and that is the reference signal. Exactly. So now we have multiple pulses per half, uh, multiple pulses per or half cycle. We can also define the frequency modulation index as the ratio of frequencies carrier divided by the reference frequency. In the same way, we define the index for my magnitude. And you're going to do the same thing. Now compare these two signals. When the reference is greater than the carrier, we turn the transistor on. And when the reference is smaller in magnitude than the carrier, then the circuit is off. And you can see the result here. We get this that's called as a Boolean variable, either zero or one, either on or off. And this is what we provide now to the transistor, to the H bridge. The number of pulses per half cycle, which was one before, now changes and now depends on the frequency of both the carrier and on the frequency of the reference signal as well. And if you do a simple trigonometric calculation there, you'll see that it will depend on the ratio of the two frequencies divided by two. That is the modulation index divided by two. Now this equation holds. We specify the frequency of each signal. The module gives the frequency modulation index, divide that by two, and that's the number of pulses per half cycle, hence this number two in the denominator here. Okay, and by pulses, I mean, of course, here we have three pulses. Half cycle is pi, three pulses per half cycle. Question? Yes. Uh, for the previous slide, why is the duty cycle shrinking? Good question. Why is the duty cycle shrinking? Any, does anybody know the answer? Oh, the reference signal is uh, um, going down, I guess. Exactly. Exactly. And that's the whole point of this comparison, is to dynamically adjust the duty cycle to reflect changes in the reference signal. The greater the reference signal, the greater the duty cycle. The smaller the reference signal, the smaller the duty cycle. The smaller the average voltage across the load and the RMS voltage across the load. So that's the whole point. As the reference signal stays here, we see the duty cycle there. And now the reference signal decreased. This means that we want to decrease the voltage we are delivering to the output. So the duty cycle, needs to compensate for that and shrink. If this was increasing, then the duty cycle would now be larger than the first part. 
and that's the whole idea. Is this clear? This needs to be very clear. Otherwise, uh, the upcoming slides will not make much sense. Yeah, it's clear. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you see this the for the second part here, this is the only portion where the carrier, the reference is greater than the carrier. Everywhere else is the opposite, and then we set the signal to zero. Now let's do the same we did before. We have the same idea, but we have multiple pulses, and we are dealing with a H bridge. So again, let's connect the H bridge in an appropriate manner so that the same transistors. The transistors in the same leg do not conduct at the same time. So we have this guy and that guy connected together and the other two. So now you provide a path for positive and negative currents. We're going to establish now two different signals, one for positive voltages, one for negative voltages. So for the first half cycle, the voltage reference voltage is positive. We're going to deal with the respective leg that provides positive voltages, in this case, Q1. For the second half cycle, the voltage becomes negative. The reference voltage is negative. We are dealing with the other branch of the H bridge, and that's Q2. And now let's compare their magnitudes. So for the first half cycle only, the voltage is positive, so we're going to stop at positive voltages right there. And for the second half cycle, voltages are negative. We are going to compare the two and create the gating signal. Q2. So you now have these two Boolean values, Q1 and Q2. They can either take zero or one. And you can find a simple relation to calculate the instantaneous voltage across the load by simply subtracting one from the other. Vs is the input voltage. Q1 is the blue signal. Q2 is the yellow Boolean signal. Only one is operating at a time. So if you subtract them, we see that the average voltage is either Vs or negative Vs. The instantaneous or the instantaneous voltage across the load is either Vs or negative Vs. When you combine them, this is what we get. Okay. Same idea as before. Now, if you change the reference signal magnitude, the duty cycle will adjust accordingly. We can do the same analysis and calculate the pulse width and now calculate the average and RMS voltages across the load. The equation that we have here is the same as we had before. The only difference is now we have P pulses per half cycle. Before we had one, P was one. Now here we have P pulses, number of pulses per half cycle. That is a function of the frequency modulation index. So the equation that we, we, if you solve the equation, we get this and we recognize the format from the same one we had before. P shows up here in the earlier version, P was one. The pulse width is the same as before, same definition as before, but now is divided by the number of pulses P. If you now replace this there and so for it, this is the average voltage exactly the same as we had before. Vs times the square root of the modulation index. Quick question. Same analysis. Yes, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, is pulse width, is that a percentage or is that in time? Pulse width is is uh, radians per second because our... Because our radians per second. Yeah. It would be time. If we are dealing with time, it would be time. Yeah. Right? If you if you consider the frequency information, then this would be you now the x axis would be time. So the post width is time. I remove the frequency, uh, I remove the information about time so we don't need to depend on the frequency. That's why you have here omega t. Okay, but it would be time. Yeah. Yes. Uh, why is the view? Uh, formula not changed, like why is it uh, times root n when uh, the delta has been changed to divided by p? Because both have changed. Delta has changed. And also the pulse width, pulse width has changed. See, this changed because of p, right? The pulse width that before was defined as m equals to delta over pi, 
we can take the poke width here as pi times m. This would hold, as you calculated before, for one pulse, but now we have p pulses, so we need to divide that by p. So we, have, we multiply this by p and we divide that by p so they cancel out and we go back to the same equation. Thank you. So same equation, now the RMS voltage across the load is the input voltage times the, modulation, the square root of the modulation index. We can complicate this with some interesting Fourier series. I'm going to skip this. You don't need to worry about that. Now let's get uh, to the point that I started with uh, when I started this lecture. Let's do a sinusoidal waveform in the output. How do you do a sinusoidal waveform in the output? Just create it. Now make your reference signal a sinusoidal waveform. And that's what you have here. The carrier has changed a little bit. We have this carrier that now goes positive and negative. The magnitude on both ends is of course the same. And we have this sinusoidal waveform, and that's what we wish to apply to the load. Once again, the carrier has a much greater frequency than our reference signal. For example, if you're dealing here with a one kilohertz reference signal or a 50 hertz, the carrier would be in the order of 50 kilohertz. And our job now is to try to replicate that in the output. So there are two ways to do this. There is the so-called bipolar sinusoidal pulse width modulation, and there is the unipolar sinusoidal, sinusoidal pulse width modulation. Let's start with the bipolar. In this configuration, the upper and lower switches in the same leg work in a complementary manner. So if one leg is on, the other leg is off. We are connecting capital Q1 to capital Q4. They have the orange line. The gating signal is lowercase q1. And you do the same for the other two. The gating signal is q2. If q1 is on, q2 is off, and so on. All right, so only one conducts at a given time. We are going to do the same thing. Now compare the, the carrier and the reference. And you're going to do that for both at the same time, for Q1 and Q2 with respect to the same sinusoidal waveform. Now we are uh, uh, looking at the, the sign itself, the sign matters. Before you're just looking at the magnitude of either one or the other, positive or negative. Now you're comparing everything, including the sign. So let's look at Q1. For example, if you take Q1, we can compare the magnitude of both signals. And we see that the reference signal is greater in this area, in this area, in that area, in this area. And then you create Q1. Q2 is the complement of Q1. Is the If Q1 is on, Q2 is off. And notice something interesting here. Look how the duty cycle adjusts as the magnitude of the sinusoidal waveform changes close to uh, the lower magnitude on the extremes here. And here you see that the duty cycle is smaller. And as we approach the peak, you see that the duty cycle increases a little bit. And you keep doing the same. Now, even for the negative portion, we are going to look at, let's say this part here, the magnitude of the carrier is, uh, sorry, the carrier is greater than the reference. Now the sign matters. We turn the switch off and so on. You continue that a comparison on and on. So this is Q1 and Q2 is simply the opposite of Q1. And now let's see what happens. Only one is on at a time. And when you combine them, we can say that the voltage in the output is either Vs or negative Vs. Now let's see what happens. In the first half cycle, the reference voltage is positive. We see that the output now goes from positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. But you see that the average voltage there is going to be positive. And the magnitude is greater towards the center of the, the peak of that sinusoidal waveform. 
when we go to the negative cycle, it's just the reverse. We see that even though the output voltage is negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, the average voltage is negative. The pulse width for the negative portion is greater than the pulse width in the positive side. And this creates now a average voltage in the second half cycle that is overall negative. And again, notice how the pulse width for both Q1 and Q2 are changing the width depending on where we are with respect to the sinusoidal waveform. Close to when the sinusoidal waveform is zero, we have a very small duty cycle. And close to the peaks, we have a larger duty cycle. And when you combine them, now we see that the voltage across the load going positive and negative but it will stay more on the positive side or more on the negative side, depending on the reference signal magnitude. This is what we call bipolar sinusoidal pulse width modulation. And the reason it's called bipolar is because now the voltage across the load is positive and negative within the same uh, period. It's always it, it, within the same half cycle, it goes positive and negative. Is this, is this clear? One quick question. Yep. So uh, if the frequency, if the carrier frequency were increased, do you sort of get closer to an ideal sinusoidal waveform? Yes, yes. That's a good point. Yeah, the closer, the greater the carrier frequency, the finer you have in your uh, gating signal. There is a limit though, because this transistors take some time to switch on and off. So they cannot be too, too large because the transistors would not have enough time to switch. And in this case here, you notice that all transistors switch at the same time. Right? So you need to take that into account as well and give them enough time to turn completely off before we turn the next one on. If there is an overlap, we are creating a short circuit. So what would it look like if we were to make the frequency greater than the transistors can switch? Uh, they, they wouldn't react. It would just create a short circuit. Okay. They would kind of be floating around a certain value and it just wouldn't work. Right? Right. They, they, they need enough time to switch on and off. Thank you. No problem. Now let's look at the unipolar sinusoidal pulse width modulation. You guessed bipolar, we go on uh, positive and negative. Unipolar for half cycle, we go only positive or only negative. The arrangement this time is a little different we see that we have two transistors in the same leg connected through an inverter. So when Q1 is on, Q3 is off. When Q2 is on, Q4 is off. Right. What happens if Q1 and Q2 are both on? So let's say this transistor is on and this transistor is on, is a possibility now. Right. What happens there? What is the voltage across the load? zero, you're shorting the load around this loop, right? You're shorting the load across that loop. So now the idea is a bit different. We have two reference signals. They are shifted by 180 degrees out of phase. They are shifted by 180 degrees out of phase. And you're going to do the comparison for Q1 with one of them and the comparison for Q2 with the second one. And let's see what happens. So here is the comparison for both signals, Q1 and Q2. One is the original signal. The only one takes a signal that is shifted by 180 degrees. When Q1 and Q2 are different, let's say we have one here and zero there. What is the voltage across the load? If we have one for Q1, then Q3 is zero. If you have a zero for Q2, then Q1, Q4 is one. So the voltage comes from that side, it's positive. If we reverse it, the voltage is negative. So, so long as Q1 and Q2 are different, there is a voltage across the load. It's either Vs or negative Vs. What happens if they are the same? If you put zero here or one here and one here, what is the voltage across the load? 
V0 equals to? Zero. Zero. Exactly. Uh, these two here are open. I remember there is an inverter here, a little nice inverter. We are now closing the path across the load here. There is no voltage across the load. So if Q1 and Q2 are different, there is a voltage across the load. If Q1 and Q2 are the same, there is no voltage across the load. Depending now if Q1 is on, then we have plus Vs. If Q1 is off, Q2 is on, then you have negative Vs. We can now compare these two signals and apply the logic we just discussed. In this very small period here, or to start with, we have this small period in yellow. Both signals are the same. The, average, the vo load voltage, instantaneous load voltage is zero. Then during that small next interval, Q2, Q1 is on, Q2 is zero. So there is a positive voltage across the load. Then they overlap again, they are both on, zero. Then we switch. Now Q1 is on, Q2 is zero. Average voltage again, positive, and so on. And you'll notice here the same trend. Towards the zeros of the sinusoidal waveform, the duty cycle tends to zero. Towards and close to the peak of the sinusoidal waveform, the duty cycle increases automatically. Once you reach the second half cycle, we see that now the voltage across the load is only negative. It's only negative. And this is what we call the why we call this unipolar post width modulation because now for half of a cycle we are modulating positives or negative voltages across the load with only positive or negative cycles of voltage, not positive and negative as we had before. I can compare them here. Okay, so both are implemented. In reality, uh, the unipolar is a bit easy, is, it provides better distortion factors. So the, here are some advantages and disadvantages of them. The bipolar uh, needs all transistor to switch at the same time, is easier to implement, but it requires a larger filter in the output because of ripple currents. The unipolar modulation, uh, we have transistors that are not switching at the same time now. It's more efficient than bipolar and the distortion factor of the output voltage is improved. So most of the time the unipolar modulation, especially for what we do in mechatronics is preferred. Okay, so I'm gonna move on here because I'm, I should be starting the exercises by now, but I always talk too much. So now how do we find the average voltage here? We need to find the pulse width and the pulse width now depends on the modulation index as it did before. But now things are a bit more complicated. I'm going to skip the derivation here because we, we have an indetermination here. We have the pulse width that it depends on the modulation index. And you have the modulation index that we can calculate. But to calculate the modulation index, guess what? We need the pulse width. And we are now stuck. All right, so the only way to solve for this is through numerical simulations. To find the actual post width. Um, they both depend on in, on the, in the same variable. So the RMS volt output voltage is calculated in the same way we calculated before. Pulse width divided by pi is now sum across the entire half cycle. And that's the way we get this, the uh, RMS output voltage in the same way you got before. Now we, here we have the sum of all pulses. Right? It's like taking the integral of the area uh, under uh, the pulses in a discrete fashion. And last concept that I, I need to introduce is the under and over modulation. In some applications, we are going to go over one for the modulation index. Let's see what happens here. 
the for sinusoidal pulse width modulation, if you go from zero to one, then the following holds the fundamental out peak, the peak fundamental output voltage. If we expand this equation numerically, is given by the modulation index times Vs. Modulation index times Vs, the same way we had for a DC to DC converter. But this is only valid between zero and one modulation index. So if you plot this average voltage according to the modulation index, we see that we have a linear relation. Right? The ratio between the input and the output is linearly increases with respect to the modulation index up to one. But now in some application, it is desirable to go beyond one and have a modulation index that grows higher. And that's what we see in the example here. You see that the carrier has a greater, the reference has a greater magnitude than the carrier. All right, so the duty cycle will stay on for a much larger period of time as compared to before. And this is what you call the over modulation. In some applications, it is required just to maintain a more realistic way of forming the output. So this approach, this, this equation that the duty cycle, the peak fundamental output voltage is linearly dependent on the modulation index only holds between zero and one. Anything greater than one, this doesn't hold anymore. The system becomes nonlinear. If you're under one, we call that under modulation. If you are over one, we call that over modulation. Okay. Any questions? We're going to do some exercises. No? Very well. Okay, so let's do some exercises. Let's just start with exercise 26. We have a full bridge inverter that uses multiple pulse width module uses multiple pulse width modulation to control the output voltage across the five ohm resistance. Calculate the amplitude of the fundamental component of the output voltage across the resistor. The amplitude of the fundamental component of the output voltage. What can we see here? We have a carrier signal, magnitude is one at 50 kilohertz, and you have a reference sinusoidal waveform whose magnitude is 0 0.7 volts and runs at a frequency of 50 hertz. Why is that information useful? What can we do with that? Let me ask you this, what is the frequency at the output voltage. Is that determined by the reference or is that determined by the carrier? The reference. The reference. Is the impedance of this capacitor and this uh, inductor determined by the carrier or the reference? The reference. The reference as well, right? We want 50 hertz to appear here. So this whole thing will run at 50 hertz. The impedance of this inductor and this capacitor will both depend on the carrier frequency. We have here the magnitude of both. So we can calculate the modulation index. The modulation index is the voltage of the reference divided by the voltage of the carrier. And this is 0.7 divided by one, 0 0.7. All right, that's the modulation index. What is the fundamental component of the RMS voltage across the load? So the output here, the fundamental component of the RMS voltage is simply Vs equals to the uh, load is called that the load Vs times the modulation index for a sinusoidal waveform. Yeah. This, we, this slide we just saw. This is the fundamental component of the RMS voltage, Vs times M. This is an approximation, but this holds fine. So what is this? The imp what is the input voltage to the bridge? What is the input voltage to the bridge? Sorry, 
Say that again. I couldn't hear you. <coughs> Question. Yeah. Um, when you say fundamental uh, voltage, do you mean like the peak voltage? No, I mean the fundamental component. Remember that because of the harmonics, some of them they have no effect on the output. They have higher harmonics. We are looking at the first one, the fundamental component of the the one, the first harmonic in the output. This holds right? Vs times the modulation index, not the average. What is the input voltage to the bridge? This should be the 100, 100 volts. 100 volts. Yeah, this is the input voltage to the bridge. So we have 100 times 0 0.7, and we are working with 7 volts, 70 volts RMS for the fundamental component. Very well. Now, if you want to calculate the voltage across this resistor, we'll need to do the impedance of this parallel circuit and then do a voltage divider. But first, you need to calculate the impedances of these two elements. What is the impedance offered by the capacitor? What is the, let's call that XC. What is the impedance of the capacitor? It's one over C at C omega J. All right, so that is XC is one over the capacitor has a capacitance of 63.66 microfarads times the frequency. What is the frequency? It's two pi times, times what? 50. Times 50. All this times J. So this gives Fifty over J, which is the same as negative fifty J. The inductor has a an impedance of L times omega J. It's the same idea. L is given here. Is nine point five millihenry. Omega is two pi times fifty, and J is a complex complex variable. So this is 3J. Okay, so 9.55 milli times 2 pi 50, 3J. Okay, now what? Now what do we do? We have 3J, negative 50J, and five, we need to find the parallel of these two inducts, uh, these two uh, elements here. What is the parallel there? Did, did anybody have a question there? Uh, yeah, why is it negative 50J? So 50J times J divided by J, J times J negative one. Oh, do we just do that to what's out of the denominator? Yeah. Okay. So what is the parallel of these two here? Let's call that Z parallel. What is it? Is the multiplication of them. So is negative 50J times five divided by their sum, five minus 50J. That's the parallel impedance between the capacitor and the resistor. So I'm going to skip complex variables here. This should be clear by now. So this gives 4.79 with an angle of negative 5.71 degrees. Now you know how to solve this. It's a complex variable. I'm going to, to, to skip that. Multiply these, multiply bo both numerator and denominator by the inverse, uh, by the complement of this. So 5 plus 50J divided by 5 plus 50J. The denominator disappears. It become, the complex part disappears from the denominator. You find a vector, calculate the magnitude and the angle of that vector. Here it is. Or if you remember from control systems, we could calculate the angle here as there is, if you think this J as an S, there is a zero in this transfer function. So we have 90 degrees for the angle minus the angle of the denominator, A10, 50 over five. And this is that, All right. So either way, 
up to you. So this is the impedance. This is the imp this is this parallel impedance here and there that you see here. Three J for the the resist the inductor. Z is what we just calculated right here. What is the voltage across the load now? We have our 70 volts fundamental component of the RMS voltage that we calculated there. This is the impedance of the inductor. That's the parallel impedance. So the voltage across the resistor, because it's in parallel with the capacitor, is the same as the voltage across the parallel of them. So the voltage across Z is the voltage across the inductor. The, the, sorry, let me start that again. The voltage across Z is the same voltage across the capacitor and the inductor. So how do you do a voltage divider on this? How do you do a voltage divider here? It would just be 70 times Z over XL plus Z. Exactly. All right, that's a voltage divider. So this gives 70 times, let's do times 4.79 with an angle of negative 571 divided by 3J plus 4.79 degrees. How do you solve this? Well, if you are interested in the magnitude, then this is easy. We have 70 times 4.79 divided by the magnitude of the denominator, square root of the real part squared, what is the real part of this? There's no real part there is zero. The real part of this is 4.79 cosine of the angle, negative 5.71 is all squared, plus the imaginary part squared, three, plus the imaginary part of that, 4.79, sine of negative 5.71, all squared. Where is this coming from? Remember that this is a vector. This is the real, this is the imaginary portion. We have a vector like that. This magnitude is 4.79. And this angle here, uh, it was supposed to be negative, is 5.71, right? So the real part, is the cosine projection. The imaginary part is the sine projection of that. And because here we are dealing with the magnitude of this complex number, now first find the imaginary in the real parts of this, then add the real, add the imaginary, both square, the square root gives the magnitude of that signal. And the answer, final answer here, if you calculate all that, is 62.7 volts. Questions? <coughs> Professor? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if I did something wrong, but I get 4.97 instead of 4.79. Yeah, I got that too. Yeah, okay. Maybe I just made a small mistake in the calculation. Uh, but but uh, the I will... uh, final V out is still the same. Yeah, okay. So I probably may just made a small mistake here in this calculation. But the the idea is remains the same, right? Yeah, so I'll, I'll double check that later. Thanks. Did I write? And maybe I just wrote the wrong number here when I made my notes. Yeah, I have four point seven nine. Oh, sorry, you said the point five nine, right? Uh, nine seven, I think. Nine seven. Okay. No. Okay. I I, I don't know. You're probably right. So four. No, the the development does it doesn't change, so I'll, I'll just leave it for now. And I'll correct that in the posted notes. Any any other questions? No. All good. Really, what we did, what what we learned from this lecture, is this. That is it. 
right? This is what all we, we learned today. Everything else is basic electronics. And maybe another thing to take from this is that the impedances here depend on the, the reference voltage frequency, but that's all. Very well, if there are no more questions, let's do exercise 27. As I raised the whiteboard, uh, take a look at what the question asks. And let's try that one. Uh, professor? Yeah? Could you please explain uh, what the fundamental component of the voltage is again? The fundamental component of the RMS voltage, as we saw in the other lectures, is the, it comes from the fact that we don't have a single, in this case, 50 Hertz voltage in the output. Because this is a nonlinear system switching on and off, we are going to have harmonics that are multiples of that fundamental frequency. So we're going to, if you put an oscilloscope there, you'll see 50 Hertz. And you'll see small modulations of multiples of 50 Hertz. That is 100, 150, 200, and so on. Those we have a smaller magnitude, but they will not contribute to, the, to delivering power to the load. They are merely there because of the effects of nonlinear behavior. The only one that is useful for us is the first uh, frequency, is the fundamental frequency which is 50 Hertz. And that's why they don't match. The fundamental is smaller than the, the, than, uh, the magnitude we want to provide. Right? Here, it would be the voltage that you have to determine would have an effect on the output. And that effect is, uh, some of it is wasted in this higher harmonics. And that's where this discrepancy comes from. Okay. All right, so these markers, were clearly a bad idea. They show they are nice, but they don't dry, they don't go away. So let's do this finally. So half bridge inverted su supplies this RL load. The control signals are generated using a sinusoidal pulse width modulation. At 50 Hertz, the load draws an active power of 1.44 kilowatts. Determine the input voltage. So the modulation index is 0 0.6 in this case, and the active power is defined as RV cosine of theta. These are in terms of RMS voltages. What is the impedance here? The impedance is 30 plus 0 0.3 over pi times two pi times the frequency 50 J. This is for the inductor. So this gives 40 plus 30 J, resistor inductor, oh, sorry, 30, 30 plus 40 J. I say something and I write something else. Just a heads up, uh, that might be a difference between what you're writing and what we have. Uh, we have uh, 40 ohms for the resistor. So you writing 40, I'm wondering maybe your answers have some numbers interchanged. So just a heads up. Oh, you have 40 here? Yeah, we have 40. Yeah, just a heads up. In case, I figured once you wrote 40 there, maybe there's some different numbers in different spots. No, you're right. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, this yeah, is no indeed worries. 40. Yeah, in, interestingly, the, uh, the slide is 30. I'm, oh, oh, probably a copy and paste mistake. All right, so this was correct. Then 40 plus 30 J ohms. The magnitude of Z is 40 squared plus 30 squared square root. That is going to be 50, and the angle is arc tangent of 30 divided by 40, 36.86. That's the impedance. Right, now nothing extraordinarily complicated here. This is basic electrical circuits. Now let's go back there. We know that at this specific frequency, we draw 1.44 kilowatts. What is I? I is V over Z. Calculated here. Right. 
V is the voltage across the load and cosine of theta, theta is determined there. So from this, you can calculate V as power times the magnitude of Z divided by cosine of this square root. All right, this is V squared, just moved things around. The magnitude here is 50. And this gives a voltage RMS for the fundamental component across the load of 3,300 volts. Uh, that's the RMS voltage in the load. Now, what is, all right, so we did maybe half of it because we have the RMS voltage across the load. And we want to calculate VS, VS. So to go from the RMS to VS, we first need to convert this into peak to peak voltage and then account for the modulation index. So what is the voltage from peak to peak? If this is the RMS voltage across the load. I think it's uh, root two times it. Exactly, 300 times square root of two. So this is the peak to peak voltage across the load for the fundamental component here. This doesn't take it into account the modulation index or the duty cycle. So now how we go from this, which is the one after the modulation index to what is supplied there, V1. We divide by. We divided by M. M. So V1 is V peak to peak divided by M, which is the modulation index. So now, how do we go from, point? sorry? Could you please repeat that point? For how you found V1? This is the voltage peak to peak, the RMS component, the peak to peak fundamental across this part here, right? But this is the effect after we modulated the input at 0 0.6. So to go from this to the original voltage, we need to now divide by that. This voltage that we calculated there was V equals to M times V1. We calculated, we, we, just, calcul we just calculated uh, this one, right? This is the input voltage, this is the effective voltage. This is what you calculated now. So to go from this to the actual magnitude of the supplied voltage, we need to divide that by. So now we are here, we are at V1. Okay, we are at V1. Yeah. How do you go from V1 to Vs? What is the relation? This is a half bridge inverter. You just so to go from V1 here. to Vs times two. Okay, so this gives 300, 3000 square root of two times two divided by 0 0.6. And this is 1,000 1, square root of two volts. All right. So if this is not clear, you can go the other. You can go back from this all the way back to the fundamental component across there. All right. Any any questions? Uh, where did you get that equation for power? Was that in one of the previous lectures? This is, uh, I'm assuming, this is basic electronics that we didn't cover this. Uh, I'm assuming that this is in your knowledge base. All right, this is probably from electronics. That's my assumption that this was covered in electronics. That, that Active power, oh, sorry. it was not? No, that, I'm just saying that equation, it says that's just the real component of the power and the current, right? Yeah, is the, is the active power, the real component of the power, yeah. Okay, thank you.